came across this uh, article this week. It had prayers from children. I love these things. They make me laugh. Dear God, please send a new baby for mommy. The new baby you sent last week cries too much. That's Debbie, age seven. Dear God, who did you make smarter, boys or girls? My sister and I want to know, Jimmy B. Dear God, how many angels are there in heaven? I would love to be the first kid in my class to know the answer. That was from Norma. Dear God, this is my prayer. Could you please give my brother some brains? So far, he doesn't have any. <laughs> this kid must have been an eye one. Thank you for the nice day today. You even fooled the TV weatherman. <laughs> Dear God, please bring me a new brother, the one I got socks me all the time. Dear God, please help me in school. I need help in spelling, adding, history, geography, and writing. I don't need help in anything else. <laughs> Dear God, do you have any helpers in heaven? I'd like to be one of your helpers in heaven when I have summer vacation. I'm saying my prayers for me and my brother Billy because Billy is six months old and he can't do anything but sleep and wet his diapers. I love kids and their honesty, right? That's really how you got to pray. Today, we're going to be talking about communicating with the personal God, really prayer. Somebody asked me today, now, is this part of that foundation series? Yes, it is. And I want to tell you why. It's because what we believe matters. I want to tell you why it matters today. We don't think about prayer being based on our doctrine necessarily, do we? We think that's, well, that's just something you do. Prayer is a conversation with God. However, conversations can be just the, the trading of information and, and don't really feel like they lead to a, to a true personal encounter or relationship. And we don't want to just know about God, but we want to know God, to seek His face and His presence. The past few weeks, we've looked at the deity of the Father, the deity of the Son, the deity of the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked briefly about the Trinity. Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus sends his disciples into the world to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, gives us a nice compressed picture of the triune nature of God. It doesn't say the names, but rather it states that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all have a single name. In biblical times, a name denoted the very nature of the person. It wasn't just a label. And so that means that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all share one divine nature, that they are one being. There's only one God, not three. They are all equally God. And yet there are three persons within unity of God's being who are equally vine, who know and love one another, and who from all eternity have together worked for our salvation. So the implications of that for prayer are many. It means that God has always had within himself a perfect friendship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are adoring one another. They're they're giving glorifying love to one another. They're delighting in one another. We know of no joy higher than being loved and loving in return. But a triune God would know that love and that joy in unimaginable, infinite dimensions. God's therefore infinitely, profoundly happy, filled with perfect joy, not some abstract tranquility, but the fierce happiness of dynamic loving relationships i don't know about y'all i don't think about god being happy do you i want to be happy but i don't think about god being happy i think about god being god and stern you know and ready to judge and all those big powerful godly things and i don't think about god smiling and being happy but he has perfect friendship with Jesus, the Father, the Son, the three of them, all one. But they know how to love. They experience that love. They experience that fellowship. 
If God didn't need to create other beings in order to know love and happiness, then why did he do so? Jonathan Edwards, that early American pastor, argues that the only reason that God would have for creating us was not to get the cosmic love and joy of a relationship, because he already had that, but to share it. It's completely consistent for a triune God who is other-oriented in his very core, who seeks the glory only to give it to others. It was only natural for him to communicate happiness and to delight in his own divine perfections and beauty to others. Augustine wrote that our ability to love other people is just an image of the internal Trinitarian love that we were created to reflect. So we can see why a triune God would call us to converse with Him, to know Him, to relate to Him. It's because He wants to share the joy that He has. Prayer is our way of entering into the happiness of God Himself. Now, the disciples had seen Jesus pray in a lot of, a lot of circumstances. They'd heard Him talk about prayer. They'd heard him talk about the difference between genuine conversation with God and just reciting a prayer in public for show. In the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, Jesus gives them an example of how to pray. In Luke, it tells us, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And then... Luke has a version of what we call the Lord's Prayer. Matthew has a, a little bit longer version. We're going to look at that. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Talking about how to pray. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Let's go back and break that down. Our Father in heaven. There's a couple things here. This is who we're praying to. It's an intimate approach. It's using the familiar form like we would say, Daddy. This was unparalleled in first century Judaism. To actually think that you had a personal relationship, a familial relationship relationship with God. As Christians, we should consider God as accessible as the most loving human father. Who would dare to address God this way and claim the same honor as the Son of God? Unless we had been adopted as children. Remember, we can approach God with confidence because Jesus is interceding God on our behalf and because his righteousness has been credited to our account. We can approach God with confidence because the Holy Spirit is praying for us. Doctrine in action. May your name be kept holy. Hallowed. Exalt him or praise him. We're praying that God's name would be kept holy. Lord, keep us from dishonoring your name. Empower us to be godly representatives. It's also a prayer that God would be glorified among all the nations, that faith in God would spread around the world. Jesus says, pray that your kingdom come soon. That's a lordship request. We're asking God to extend his royal power over every part of our lives. It's also to yearn for that future day of God's justice and peace and the end of suffering, injustice, poverty, and death. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Submitting to God. You know, unless we're profoundly certain that God is our Father, we're never going to be able to honestly say, your will be done. Only if we trust God as Father can we ask for the grace to bear our troubles with patience and grace. This is the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but yours. 
He submitted to his father's will rather than following his own desire, and it saved us. So one of the things that tells me is that we can trust God the Father. Jesus did. He says, okay, I don't like this plan, but I'm going with it. And it saved us. And if Jesus can trust God's plan, if Jesus the Son can trust the plan of God the Father, then certainly we can too. So that we can honestly pray, Father, I would love to see this happen. Or I'd love to not have to go through this. But you know what? I trust you. And so your will be done, not mine. Now, the first half of this prayer is God-centered. It's adoration. It's thanksgiving. It's submission. That heals our heart of self-centeredness. It reframes our thinking. And now we're ready to mention our needs. Give us today the food we need. Look to God for his provision. It really carries the idea of give us today what we need for tomorrow. It's the same idea as Proverbs 30, verse 8. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me just enough to satisfy my needs. Since we've recognized God as our true source, we can come with the right frame of mind. We come with our needs, expectant of a positive response, but we don't come arrogantly or anxiously or tell him this is what has to happen. Things that we've agonized over, we can ask for without desperation because we trust him. Forgive us. Our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. Very simple, confessing our sins to him. It's a challenge to our pride, isn't it? I tell you, we hate to admit that we're wrong. If you ever watched the show Happy Days, you remember Happy Days and the Fonz? That was one word he could not say was wrong. Remember he'd be, I was, he could never, he could never get it out. We're like that sometimes in our prayer, a lot of times in our prayers. Or if we can, we'll be like, please forgive me that they got mad at me. You know, we don't like to take responsibility. We ought to see the hypocrisy of seeking God's forgiveness from someone when we're holding a grudge. In this case, unresolved bitterness is a sign that we're not right with God. Jesus says, then pray, don't let us yield to temptation. This is a better translation than one that says, don't lead us into temptation. God doesn't tempt. Scripture tells us that. God doesn't tempt us. What we're doing is we're asking for protection from the sin desires within us. We're asking that God would help us not to give in to temptation. And then to rescue us from the evil one, there we're asking for protection from the evil outside of us. We're trusting God to deliver us. Jesus didn't say, this is what you ought to pray. You should quote this prayer every time. He's given us the elements of prayer. He's saying, hey, here's how to pray. Here's the things. Here's the things you need to pray about. Well, if that's what we're supposed to pray about, when are we supposed to pray about it? Got a couple verses for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, never stop praying. Or some of us learn, pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6, 18, after Paul writes about putting on the armor of God, he says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all the believers everywhere. Pray continually. Prayer is to be more of a lifestyle Not something we do when we feel our backs against the wall or when we're in deep trouble. Prayer ought to be as normal as breathing. Now, if that's the case, some of us, me included, have been guilty of holding our breath sometimes, haven't we? 
The word for prayer here is a general word that encompasses those things that we talked about. Thanksgiving, confession, praise, intercession for others, personal requests to God. The word continually refers to something that is constantly recurring. So prayer is like a long conversation with God that's never broken. Jesus put it this way in Luke 18.1. He said to the disciples, he said that we should always pray and not give up. It doesn't have to be a formal prayer where you sit down, you fold your hands, you bow your head. We can pray anywhere and everywhere because we have confidence that God is everywhere all at the same time. You see, we come back to what we believe about God. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. Because of that, we can pray anywhere, anytime. It's a gift given to us through the Holy Spirit who is with every believer in Christ. When you read the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus prayed continually to start his day, to end his day, all night long, before a miracle, after a miracle. He communed with the Father throughout his day. He also talked to other people. He ate, he walked, he napped. He was not just on his knees in a room somewhere all day long. So when we say pray without ceasing, we're not talking about just lock yourself away from the world in a little room and that's all you should ever do. He didn't walk around with his head bowed and his eyes closed all day. He didn't do, that'd be kind of like we do with our phones now, right? He wasn't doing that. But he went through his day with a definite sense of living in the presence of God the Father, and he communicated throughout the day with him. We can do the same thing. In order to permeate our life with prayer, here's some practical steps. Schedule a set time each day to pray. I have a set time in the morning. I go, I spend some time in the Word, and then I spend anywhere from a half hour to an hour praying. Pray spontaneous. We all know the popcorn prayer, right? <sighs> Lord, I'm going into this interview. Please help me. It's okay to have popcorn prayers. Hopefully your prayer life has a little bit more than just the popcorn prayers. Otherwise, like your diet, you wouldn't be in the healthiest of shape. But those are legit. Pray while you're waiting on something. Pray with others on the phone. Offer to pray when somebody shares a burden with you. We're great about someone saying, hey, would you pray for me, blah, 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 blah. And we go, yeah, I'll do that. And then that's kind of the end of it, right? We may or may not remember to pray for it later. Why don't you just pray for them right there? When I was in seminary, I worked on the floor crew. So we were responsible, vacuuming, waxing floors, all that stuff. And so we'd go through and we'd check the professor's offices you know, if they were gone or whatever, and clean their offices sometimes if we needed to or if they put in a request. And one day, we had a world religions professor, John Johnson. He was from South Africa. Loved the guy. And uh, the guy that I was working with, we stopped by the office, and he was asking us about, you know, what was going on in our lives and, you know, what we felt like God was teaching us, what, God, what we felt God was calling us to do when we got out of seminary. Now, all of a sudden, before we leave, he jumps out of his chair and he grabs us, scared the fire out of me. I didn't know what we had done. And then we realized, oh, he's praying for us. And so we bow our heads. We left going, okay, that was really cool. You know, in college, I had professors that were working hard to flunk me out. But to have a professor that was praying for me, that was different. He would come in before an exam and he'd pray for us. And we never knew if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Like... <laughs> Is that helpful, or is this test going to be so hard he thought he had to come in and pray for somebody right when they tell you the need? Take a moment. Pray in the car while you're driving, but please keep your eyes open. Those of you that have had jobs, I've had jobs where I was in the car a lot. I prayed a lot. It's just me and God talking. Join others in prayer. We have our Saturday morning prayer times. We'll have another one, I think, the first Saturday of December. Come. 
nobody cares if you don't have to pray in King James English or know what you're doing. You just talk to God. Or if you want to pray out loud, just pray quiet. But it's awesome to be in a group that's praying together. You see God draw you together. The first time we did that, the second time we did that, I left amazed at the sense of fellowship between us as we were fellowshipping with God. Come and experience that. Maybe write out your prayers in a notebook. Even if you don't go word for word, just write, prayed for pastor today. Prayed for this, you know. Just make a list. That's what I prayed for today. Then sometime go back and review it. You'll be amazed at how many of those get answered. Pray for what you see and hear. You're at the coffee shop and you hear a conversation. can't tell you how many times I've been at a coffee shop and heard somebody else sharing the gospel with somebody else, and I could pray for them while they were doing that. Never met them. Never talked to them afterwards. They never met me. Maybe one day we'll show up in heaven and that person they were sharing with will be there too and say thanks. You didn't know it, but it, it made a difference. Just commune with God throughout the day. When I was in college, walking to class, that's prayer time between every class. It's me and God having conversations. As you go throughout your day, think about God, talk to God, meditate on His greatness, think about what He's doing. So what does that mean for us? Spend time with God. He speaks through His Word. His Spirit lives inside of us and speaks to us. My experience is that the more I listen and obey, the more I recognize His voice. You know, I go through those times, you know, when we, th when we think, wow, God hadn't been speaking to me lately, but if I'll be quiet and sit still, He is. Sometimes I just need to be quiet enough to listen. I've said this before. One of the things that, that somebody said recently that really helped me was when we see God, his word is his action. Like he didn't say, let there be light, and then he had to go make light. He said, let there be light, and there was light. His word and his action are the same thing. So all those days when I read the Bible, I think, oh, God, I wish you'd speak to me today. He did. I just read his written word. He has spoken to me today. So the issue is not whether God was speaking to me. The issue is whether I can understand what he's saying. So one of the things I've started doing in my Bible reading is I get done, and the question that I ask is, God, what did you tell me today? It's changing my prayer life. It's changing my Bible study. I'm reading it different because I already know that God has spoken to me. Spend time with God. Second, remember that prayer is relational. Listen, don't look for a formula. Praying is not reciting an incantation. Are there different areas that we need to, to remember and to be balanced in? Yeah. You know, we all know all sorts of acronyms like the ACTS acronym, A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, all good things, but you don't have to pray that in order. Some days it may be scat. <laughs> Some day it may be cats, you know? Let me tell you, about three months after I had heart surgery, I stepped out on the back porch. It was January. I was letting the dog out, and I decided for some odd reason that I'd go out in the wicked cold and I'd stand on the patio in the moonlit night and freeze for just a few moments. Walked across the crunchy snow, hit the top step going down to the patio. It was no longer crunchy snow. It was sheer ice and my feet went flying up in the air. And can I tell you when I was in the air, I did not start with, dear God, you were so awesome. You deserve glory and honor and I rejoice in your holy name. I prayed, oh, God, don't let me hit my head and die. You don't have to pray in order. It's okay to memorize prayers in Scripture, but don't just mentally check out and quote them. 
Again, they're not incantations or spells. It doesn't matter how many times you quote the Lord's Prayer. God's not obligated to do anything for you. If you're going to memorize the prayer, think about what it means. Think about what you're saying when you quote it. Otherwise, you might as well quote a recipe. If I responded to Amy with the same thing every time she said, I love you, it wouldn't mean very much. Honey, I love you. That's how she sounds. <laughs> and then I say, dear Amy, I love you very much. You're the best wife I've ever had. I like you. You are nice. <laughs> Dave, thanks for all you do around the house. You're such an amazing husband. Dear Amy, I love you very much. You are the best wife I've ever had. I like you. You are nice. <laughs> that wouldn't fly very long, would it? It wouldn't mean a whole lot to Amy. I can tell already. You might hear that again. <laughs> if all we're doing is quoting prayers, our heart's not in it, our mind's not in it, it doesn't mean anything. Don't turn prayer into a formula. You might find a book, somebody, if you pray my way, God will answer your prayers. You know what? That's a lie. It's a false teaching. God does what he wants. He wants to have a conversation with us, and there's no magical way for you to say to God what's going to change God's mind to do what you want, because it's not about you. But if you have a conversation with God from your heart and you say, God, I have a need and I don't know how to meet it, you'll get God's attention. And God will meet that need, but it may have nothing to do with what you have in mind about how that's going to happen. You can pray all you want, but if you don't have that attitude, Lord, your will be done, but not mine. You're going to be disappointed in your prayer life. But if you pray, God, your will be done, not mine, and you're praying, you're going to see God work in your life. You're going to see God work in your heart because you have a relationship with God. And it's not a formula. Third thing, don't just ask for stuff. That's what some people think prayer is. Well, I ask God for stuff. It's not that. Have a conversation. Look for his will. Thank him. Ask questions. Listen. Tell him how you feel. Tell him about your fears and your struggles. Ask him to help you grow. Ask him for wisdom. Ask him to help you and others know how to walk closely with him. Have a conversation. Build a friendship with God, just like you would with anybody else. Those things that we read and we don't understand, spend some time with God and say, I don't get it. You look really loving in the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, and sometimes I read the Old Testament, and God, you seem kind of mean sometimes. I don't understand. I know you're not a different God, so help me understand how that all fits together. Spend time with Him. Lord, I was reading that I've got to put off all these old attitudes, but Lord, they're all over the place in my life. How do I do that? Lord, how do I get rid of this anger that I have? I think I'm doing good, and then somebody cuts me off on the road, and <laughs> I blow up. What's the deal? How do I get rid of that? Lord, I know I'm supposed to forgive somebody, but he's a jerk, and he's still a jerk. How do I do that? How do I do that, God? Prayer is a duty, it's a discipline, it's a habit that we should develop. But it's more than that, it is, and it should be, our ongoing conversation with God. It's responding to His communication with us through the Holy Spirit living in us and His written word. It consists of those elements that Jesus taught us, praise, confession, thanks, asking, but prayer orients our view towards God. It brings a new perspective because it puts God 
back in the picture. Just talking to God about our fears and our hopes and our needs, our concerns, our questions, our sins, it almost immediately forces us to think differently about them. When you read the Psalms that David wrote, you see often how he starts with frustration or anger or fear. And by the time he gets done talking to God about it, he's finishing with faith and encouragement and hope. Prayer unites us spiritually with God. It's the way that all the things that we believe in and that Christ has done for us actually become our strength. The stuff we've talked about the previous week, that's not just theory. That's not just stuff for academics, for professors to sit around and talk about, for preachers smarter than I am to tell you the Greek and the Hebrew behind it. It's the stuff that affects our daily life. It's the basis for our Christian life. Prayer is the way that truth is worked into our hearts to change us. Prayer helps our hearts to sense the presence of God. When we pray, our rather abstract knowledge of God becomes real and personal to us. Our God is personal. Will you make time to get to know him? Will you let your relationship with him grow? Let's pray.